like to call this uh, meeting of the Subcommittee on Domestic Monetary Policy to order. This morning we're pleased to welcome the Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, Alan Greenspan, uh, for his uh, presentation of the Federal Reserve Semiannual Monetary Policy Report to the Congress. Mr. Chairman, uh, welcome. I'm sorry to be a little late. I ran into a little traffic problem that I didn't anticipate. Um, I uh, will put a little longer statement in the record, but I, uh, I, I want to welcome you and I want to commend you to start out, if I may, this morning. I thank you so much for continuing to uh, take the course that you and the other governors are taking, which is to uh, be concerned about the long-term health of our economy, to take the long view when all the temptations around here are to take the uh, short-term view of things. And, uh, of course, nothing uh, is more important for the future health of our economy than a monetary policy that aims for price stability, which I know uh, you are pursuing. Um, so I'd really like to thank you and the other uh, board members for taking this long view and it, uh, it certainly will be very important for the economic well-being of our country uh, for many years to come that you do that. I'd like to bring you up to date a little bit, if I can, on our legislation, uh, House Resolution 409, our legislation which would set zero inflation as the, uh, uh, the primary uh, goal the primary function of monetary policy, as you know, of course, you've endorsed the legislation. And since that time, since you've endorsed it, several Nobel Prize winning economists have endorsed it. Uh, several regional uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank presidents have endorsed it. And a number of other prominent uh, economists have endorsed this legislation. And uh, of course, I'm delighted by that. Uh, I, I think we have an opportunity. I don't know how long it'll take, but at, at some point we have the opportunity of getting the Congress behind this long-term view also. And as you well know, if we can achieve zero inflation, price stability, we can expect uh, enormous benefits to our economy, the lowest possible interest rates, the maximum sustainable growth in our economy, maximum sustainable employment, maximum sustainable savings, investment, productivity, and uh, I think all the things that we all want uh, for our economy. So I, I wanted to uh, report to you that we're coming along a little bit uh, with our legislation, and I wish I could tell you uh, when we will get it passed. Uh, but I, uh, I don't know that, but we will certainly keep working on it. I have a longer statement I'll put in the record, uh, but I don't want to take any more time. Uh, I'd like to yield at this time to our distinguished ranking member if he has any comments to make. Mr. Chairman, I have no further comments, but I would like to certainly share your, your views of Mr. Greenspan, and I, we appreciate your coming this morning. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we will put your entire statement in the record and uh, uh, would welcome your proceeding uh, as you will. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Pull that microphone just a little bit closer. Thank you. As I was saying, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to, to testify today on the Federal Reserve Semiannual Monetary Policy Report to the Congress. My prepared remarks discuss our monetary policy actions and plans in the context not only of the current and projected state of the economy, but also against the background of our longer term objectives and strategy for achieving them. The final section of the testimony addresses some issues for monetary policy raised by the increasingly international character 
of financial markets. Last year marked the seventh year of the longest peacetime expansion of the United States economy on record. Some two and a half million jobs were created and the civilian unemployment rate held steady at five and a quarter percent. Inflation was held to a rate no faster than in recent years, but unfortunately, no progress was made in 1989 toward price stability. Thus, while we can look back with satisfaction at the economic progress made last year, there is still important work to be done. About a year ago, Federal Reserve policy was in the final phase of a period of gradual tightening designed to inhibit a buildup of inflation pressures. Interest rates moved higher through the winter, but started down when signs of a more restrained aggregate demand and of reduced potential for higher inflation began to appear. As mid-year approached, a marked strengthening of the dollar on foreign exchange markets further diminished the threat of accelerating inflation. New economic data suggested that the balance of risks had shifted toward the possibility of an undue weakening in economic activity. With M2 and M3 below the lower bounds of their annual ranges in the spring, the Federal Reserve in June embarked on a series of measured easing steps that continued through late last year. Across the maturity spectrum, interest rates declined further to levels about one and a half percentage points below March peaks. Reductions in inflation expectations and reports of a softer economy evidently contributed to the drop in rates in longer term markets. The decrease in short-term rates lifted M2 to around the middle of its annual range in the latter part of the year. So far this year, the federal funds rate has remained around eight and a quarter percent, but rates on treasury securities and longer-term private instruments have reversed some of their earlier declines. Investors have reacted to stronger than expected economic data a run-up in energy prices, and increasingly attractive investment opportunities abroad, especially in Europe. Monetary policy was conducted again last year with an eye on long-term policy goals, and economic developments in 1989 were consistent with the Federal Reserve's medium-term strategy for reaching them. The ultimate objective of economic policy, as I've stated before, is to foster the maximum sustainable rate of economic growth. By ensuring stable prices, a necessary condition for maximal, maximum sustainable growth, monetary policy can play its most important role in promoting economic progress. The strategy of the Federal Open Market Committee for moving towards this goal remains the same to restrain growth in money and aggregate demand in coming years enough to establish a clear downward tilt to the trend of inflation and inflation expectations while avoiding a recession. If past patterns of monetary behavior persist, maintaining price stability will require an average rate of M2 growth over time approximately equal to the trend growth in output. During the transition, the decline of market interest rates in response to the moderation in inflation would boost the public's demand for M2 relative to nominal spending, lowering M2 velocity. M2 growth over several years accordingly may show little deceleration and it could actually speed up from time to time as interest rates decline in fits and starts. Hence, the FOMC would not expect to lower its M2 range mechanically each and every year in the transition to price stability. This qualitative description of our medium-term strategy is easy to state, but actually implementing it will be difficult. Unexpected developments, no doubt, will require flexible policy responses. 
Any such adjustments will not imply a retreat from the medium-term strategy or from ultimate policy goals. Rather, they will be mid-course corrections that attempt to keep the economy and prices on track. The easing of reserve pressures starting last June is a case in point. Successive FOMC decisions to ease operating policy were intended to forestall an economic downturn, the chances of which seemed to be increasing as the balance of risks shifted away from greater inflation. The FOMC was in no way abandoning its long-term goal of price stability. Instead, it sought financial conditions that would support the moderate economic expansion judged to be consistent with progress toward stable prices. In the event, output growth was sustained last year, although in the fourth quarter a major strike at Boeing combi combined with the first round of production cuts in the auto industry accentuated the underlying slowdown. On the inflation side, price increases in the second half were appreciably lower than those in the first. Against this background, the Federal Reserve governors and the presidents of the reserve banks foresee continued moderate economic expansion over 1990, consistent with conditions that will foster progress towards price stability over time. At its meeting earlier this month, the FOMC selected ranges for growth in money and debt it believes will promote this outcome. My testimony last July indicated the very preliminary nature of the tentative ranges chosen for 1990, given the uncertain outlook for the economy, financial conditions, and appropriate growth of money and debt. With the economic situation not materially different from what was anticipated at that time, the FOMC reaffirmed the tentative 3 to 7 percent growth range for M2 in 1990 that it set last July. This range, which is the same as that used in 1989, is expected by most FOMC members to produce somewhat slower growth in nominal GNP this year. The declines in short-term interest rates through late last year can be expected to continue to boost the public's demand for liquid balances in M2 at least for a while longer. M2 growth over 1990 thus may be faster than in recent years, and M2 velocity could well decline over the four quarters of the year absent a pronounced firming in short-term market interest rates. In contrast with M2, the range for M3 has been reduced from its tentative range set last July. The new M3 range of 2.5 to 6.5% is intended to embody the same degree of restraint as the M2 range, but it was lowered to reflect the continued decline in thrift assets and funding needs now anticipated to accompany the ongoing restructuring of the thrift industry. The committee's best judgment is that money growth within these annual ranges will be compatible with a moderation in the expansion of nominal GNP. Most FOMC members and other Reserve Bank presidents foresee real GNP growing one and three quarter to two percent over the year as a whole. Such a rate would be around last year's moderate pace, excluding the rebound in agricultural output from the 1988 drought. A slight easing of pressures on resources probably is in store. Inflation pressures should remain contained, even though the decline in the dollar's value over the past year, past half year, likely will reverse some of the beneficial effects on domestic inflation stemming from the dollar's earlier appreciation. The CPI this year is projected to increase 4 to 4.5 percent as compared with last year's 4.5 percent. Experience has shown such macroeconomic forecasts to be subject to a variety of risks. Assessing the balance of risks between production shortfalls and inflation pressures in the current outlook is complicated by several cross-currents 
in the domestic and international economic and financial situation. One risk is that the weakness in economic activity evident around year-end may tend to accumulate, causing members' forecasts about production and employment this year to be overly optimistic. However, available indicators of near-term economic performance suggest that the weakest point may have passed. The inventory correction in the auto industry, a rapid one involving a sharp reduction in motor vehicle assemblies in January, coupled with better motor vehicle sales, seems to be largely behind us. Industrial activity outside of motor vehicles appears to be holding up. Production of business equipment, where evidence has accumulated of some stability, if not an increase, in orders for capital goods, is likely to support manufacturing output in coming months. Housing starts were depressed in December by severely cold weather in much of the country, but starts bounced back strongly in January in line with a large gain in construction employment last month. From these and similar data, one can infer the beginnings of a modest firming in economic activity. While we cannot be certain that we are as yet out of the recessionary woods, such evidence warrants at least guarded optimism. There are, however, other undercurrents that continue to signal caution. One that could disturb the sustainability of the current economic expansion has been the recent substantial deterioration in profit margins. A continuation of this trend could seriously undercut the still expanding capital goods markets. However, if current signs of an upturn in economic activity broaden, profit margins can be expected to stabilize. A more deep-seated concern with respect to the longer-run viability of the expansion is the increase in debt leverage. Although the trends of income and cash flow may have turned the corner, the structure of the economy's financial balance sheet weighs increasingly heavily on the dynamics of economic expansion. In recent years, business debt burdens have been enlarged through corporate restructurings, and as a consequence, interest costs as a percent of cash flow has risen markedly. Responding to certain well-publicized debt servicing problems, creditors have become more selective in committing funds for these purposes. Within the banking industry, credit standards have been tightened for merger and LBO loans, as well as for some other business customers. Credit for construction projects reportedly has become less available because of FIREA-imposed limits and heightened concerns about overbuilding in a number of real estate markets. Among households, too, debt servicing burdens have risen to historic highs relative to income, and delinquency rates have moved up of late. Suppliers of consumer and mortgage credit appear to have tightened lending terms a little. Real estate values have softened in some locales although prices have maintained an uptrend in terms of the national averages, especially for single-family residences. These and other financial forces merit careful monitoring. While welcome from a supervisory perspective, more cautious lending does have the potential for damping aggregate demand. It is difficult to assess how serious a threat increased leverage is to the current level of economic activity. Clearly, should the economy fall into a recession, excess debt service costs would intensify the problems of adjustment. But it is unlikely that in current circumstances, strains coming from the economy's financial balance sheet can themselves precipitate a downturn. As I indicated in my prepared text, Mr. Chairman, we expect non-financial debt growth to continue to slow from its frenetic pace of the mid-1980s. This should lessen the strain and hopefully the threat to the economy. 
Among other concerns, recent events have highlighted the complex interactions between developments in the United States economy and financial markets and those in the other major industrial countries. Specifically, the parallel movements in long-term interest rates here and abroad over the early weeks of 1990 have raised questions. To what extent is the U.S. economy subject to influences from abroad? To what extent, as a consequence, have we lost control over our economic destiny? The simple answer to these questions is that the United States economy is influenced from abroad to a substantially greater degree than, say, two or three decades ago. But U.S. monetary policy is nonetheless able to carry out its responsibilities effectively. The post-war period has seen markedly closer ties among the world's economies. Markets for goods have become increasingly and irreversibly integrated as a result of the downsizing of economic output and the consequent expansion of international trade. The past decade in particular has also witnessed the growing integration of financial markets around the world. Advancing technology has fostered the unbundling and transfer of risk and engendered a proliferation of new financial products. Cross-border financial flows have accordingly accelerated at a pace in excess of global trade gains. This globalization of financial markets has meant that events in one market or in one country can affect within minutes developments in markets throughout the world. More integrated and open financial markets have enabled all countries to reap the benefits of enhanced competition and improved allocation of capital. Our businesses can raise funds almost anywhere in the world. Our savers can choose from a lengthening menu of investments as they seek the highest possible return on their funds. Our financial institutions enjoy wider opportunities to compete. In such an environment, a change in the expected rate of return on financial assets abroad naturally can affect the actions of borrowers or lenders in the United States. In response, exchange rates, asset prices, and rates of return all may adjust to new values. Strengthening linkages among world financial markets affect all markets and all investors. Just as United States markets are influenced by developments in markets abroad, foreign markets are influenced by events here. These channels of influence do not depend on whether a country is experiencing a deficit or a surplus in its current account. In today's financial markets, the net flows associated with current account surpluses and deficits are only the tip of the iceberg. What are more important are the huge stocks of financial claims, more than one and a half trillion held in the United States by foreigners, and more than 26 trillion of dollar-denominated claims on U.S. borrowers held by U.S. residents. This is in addition to the vast quantities of assets held in foreign currencies abroad. It is these holdings that can respond to changes in actual and expected rates of return. In recent years, we have seen several instances in which rates of return have changed essentially simultaneously around the world. For example, stock prices moved together in October 1987 and 1989, and in 1990, bond yields have risen markedly in many industrial countries. However, we must be cautious in interpreting such events and in drawing implications for the United States. Frequently, such movements occur in response to a common worldwide influence. Currently, the world economy is adjusting to the implications of changes in Eastern Europe where there are tremendous new opportunities to invest and promote reconstruction and growth. Those opportunities, while contributing to the increase in interest rates in the United States, 
also open up new markets for our exports. Moreover, despite globalization, financial markets do not necessarily move together. They also respond to more localized influences. Over 1989, for example, bond yields in West Germany and Japan rose about a percentage point, while those in the United States fell by a similar amount. The contrast between 1989 and 1990 illustrates the complexity of relationships among financial markets. Interactions can show through in movements in exchange rates as well as interest rates, and changes in the relative prices of assets depend on a variety of factors, including economic developments and inflation expectations in various countries, as well as monetary and fiscal policies, both here and abroad. The influence of economic policies abroad and other foreign developments on the United States economy is profound, and the Federal Reserve must carefully take them into account when considering its monetary policy. But these influences do not fundamentally constrain our ability to meet our most important monetary policy objectives. Developments within U.S. financial markets remain the strongest influence on asset prices and interest rates determined by those markets and through them on the United States economy. Exchange rates absorb much of the impact of developments in foreign asset markets, permitting U.S. interest rates to reflect primarily domestic economic conditions. Exchange rates influence the prices of products that do or can enter into international trade. Such factors can bring about changes in the composition of production between purely domestic goods and services and those entering international trade, and they can affect aggregate price movements for a time. However, the overall pace of spending and output in the United States depends on the demands upon all sectors of the U.S. economy taken together. And our inflation rate over time depends on the strength of those demands relative to our ability to supply them out of domestic production. Because the Federal Reserve is able to affect short-term interest rates in U.S. financial markets, it is able to influence the pace of economic activity in the short run and inflationary pressures longer term. To be sure, monetary policy must currently balance more factors than in previous decades, but our goals are still achievable. Monetary policy is only one tool, however, and it cannot be used successfully to meet multiple objectives. The Federal Reserve, for example, can address itself to either domestic prices or exchange rates, but cannot be expected to achieve objectives for both simultaneously. Monetary policy alone is not readily capable of addressing today's large current account deficit which is symptomatic of underlying imbalances among saving, spending, and production within the U.S. economy. Continued progress in reducing the federal deficit is a more appropriate instrument to raise domestic savings and free additional resources for productive investment. The long-term health of our economy requires the balanced use of monetary and fiscal policy in order to reach all of the nation's policy objectives. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, sir, very much for your uh, very interesting testimony. Mr. Chairman, let me uh, start by uh, asking you a couple of questions about uh, the our legislation to achieve zero inflation over the next five years. As we've held hearings on this proposal um, and otherwise uh, asked for comment from economists and others, it has seemed to me that 
broadly, three uh, objections have emerged as having some merit being serious um, objections. And I would like for you to comment briefly on each of them, if you would. And maybe you would see another one. But I, so far, it seems to me that these three emerge. The first is that um, if we were to achieve zero inflation over the next five years, that that would cause a recession. Now, it seems clear to me that the policies needed to achieve zero inflation over that period of time would not cause a recession, but I, I would certainly like for you to comment on it. Another sort of problem with the idea that uh, we have heard some of is that that inflation and interest rates at today's rates are no problem, that somehow the economy and people have adjusted to them and it's all right to have inflation running at 4 or 5 percent, to have uh, uh, treasury, long-term treasury rates at 8 or 9 percent, to have credit card rates at 17 and plus percent, and uh, uh, business and consumer rates up in the teens somewhere often. I, I don't think that's all right, but I'd like to, for you to comment on that also. There, uh, a third sort of objection to the idea has been that, that Congress shouldn't uh, interfere. That is, that, uh, that the Fed is entirely independent and that Congress should have no role in setting this overall uh, policy goal. And, and that would have to include the administration also because, as you know, our legislation uh, is legislation, would require a presidential uh, signature. Let me add that those are the three that we've heard the most of. There is a, a, uh, a fourth, I think, that please comment on also, and that is that somehow that there are other goals that are more important. That is to say that uh, that the Fed ought to uh, shoot for oh, a particular foreign exchange rate for the dollar as opposed to controlling inflation, or that the Fed ought to shoot for a uh, particular level of short-term interest rates as opposed to zero inflation, or that it ought to shoot for a particular level of growth in the economy uh, as opposed to zero inflation. So I guess there are really four uh, uh, questions that I would like for you to comment on, if you would. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, address them seriatim. Uh, we have a course, uh, given considerable thought to the question of whether endeavoring to bring inflation down to uh, non-inflationary levels, which uh, we define as any particular price level which removes the uncertainties with respect to future inflation from economic decision making. It's our view that over a period of years, we see no difficulty in bringing the inflation rate down from where it exists currently down to a non-inflationary level uh, with, uh, in the context of continued economic growth and the avoidance of a recession. Uh, were the change that were required significantly greater then I think the odds of our being able to do it without a recession would be uh, probably higher than any of us would find acceptable. But having brought the inflation rate down from double digit to under 5 percent, the next stage, while difficult, uh, is still achievable in our judgment without bringing on a recession. Well, I s specifically mentioned five years. Did well, I would, uh, I'd say five years. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't like to have, as I've indicated to you uh, privately and otherwise, specific numbers with respect to each year or each particular period because I think there is sufficient complexity uh, in the economy and the adjustment process uh, that 
uh, if we are short or a little long at any particular time, I don't think that's as critical as getting it right. Yes, sir. I, I quite agree with that. The uh, second question, which somehow presumes that the current inflation rate the level of interest rates, that the current state of our financial markets uh, is tolerable, is based on the assumption that the markets will stay where they are. Uh, I have serious question that they can. In other words, it is plausible and in fact uh, realistic to believe that if you have a non-inflationary environment, that is a steady state type of environment which has built into it a structure which can continue it on. One cannot say the same thing about an inflation rate which is approaching 5%, somewhat under but still close enough to that, largely because we're in an area where it is very easy to start accelerating. And I think that the major reason why we want to come down from this level is not that it is perceived to be doing great damage, although I think it is doing more damage than people realize, but that the risks of it accelerating from here are larger than I think we should be willing to tolerate. And as I think we have all experienced, an acceleration in inflation, one of takes hold is very difficult to restrain. And the ultimate impact on employment, on the level of economic growth, and on the stability of the system is just too large, in my judgment, to be tolerable. Uh, the third uh, question about should Congress interfere in Federal Reserve policy? Well, clearly, Mr. Chairman, we would like as much flexibility as we can possibly have. But uh, there is a Constitution of the United States which accords the authority uh, to the Congress, and that's Congress's judgment. Uh, our view basically is that uh, uh, we would like as much flexibility to uh, uh, attain our goals as possible, but uh, this, is a, this is an authority that comes to us from the, from the Congress and the Constitution. And uh, our judgment in this respect uh, has to be tempered by the view of the Congress. And uh, as a citizen, I think that's right and fully support it in that context. Finally, uh, the issue as to whether other goals are more important. Uh, there is uh, difficulty in knowing which particular goal affects which structure of the economy. Uh, we believe that holding the rate of inflation under control is far more important than any other variable largely because its effect is very significant in that one, as I indicated uh, in my uh, earlier remarks, the maintenance of a non-inflationary environment is a necessary condition and a major contributor towards maximum feasible economic growth and employment. It also probably is the particular goal which would stabilize exchange rates. Because as I've indicated in past testimony before this committee, one of the major goals of the G7, for example, is to seek domestic inflation stability or the domestic, uh, to, to domestic price stability, rather, as the easiest, most effective way of achieving long-term exchange rate stability. So in that sense, 
seeking price stability is also a means of seeking long-term exchange rate stability. It is also the way of achieving the lowest nominal and real interest rates rather than to seek to achieve those directly it's far superior to achieve it through a non-inflationary environment so that while these other goals are clearly important the interaction between those key goals and inflation in my judgment runs largely from inflation to those goals and therefore it is far more effective to endeavor to control the degree of inflation and inflation expectations in an economy to achieve those goals and endeavor to try to move directly to achieve them. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, Mr. Leaf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me thank you for a uh, extraordinarily fulsome report. Uh, uh, this Congress, by statute, gives you that responsibility, and I, I must say that uh, the report you presented to us uh, reflects uh, very much a, uh, a personal uh, philosophy as well as an institutional one, and I, I think we in Congress ought to be appreciative of the fact that uh, Federal Reserve is one of the few institutions that uh, takes its responsibility seriously when we legislate the whole spectrum of, of uh, reports. Uh, having said that, uh, 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 let me just uh, uh, for a moment uh, ask uh, maybe a, uh, an unfair question, but uh, in achieving a balanced or a lower rates of inflation uh, and higher growth, would it be more effective if Congress were to balance its budget or to pass a law calling for zero rates of inflation? The first is superior to the latter. Well, I only stress that in, the, in that I'm not as sympathetic as some to, to pejorative legislation uh, and, and think that the, the real thing we have to do is, is work on the deficit. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, let me just uh, move back a second because I think central bankers uh, have a tendency, and, and it, I think it's, it's part of the confidence-inspiring aspect of their jobs, uh, to stress stability in price levels and stability in exchange rates uh, and point out that there is a relationship between those two stabilities and economic growth. Uh, but the real ball game is rates of economic growth, not stability in exchange rates or stability in price levels. And here, your report uh, to us is, I must say, extraordinarily optimistic in the sense that you are, in effect, hinted that the uh, new figures that the Fed is receiving shows that the, it looks like the economy is picking up, particularly in the industrial sector. And you've also suggested that in the long term, uh, you can effectively do your job, which is something uh, that lots of other institutions in, in, in American society uh, have a hard time suggesting. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that, that you've also suggested uh, that the rate of growth for the economy this year will be one and three quarter to two percent. And one of the questions that I would have is, uh, is that an impressive goal for the Federal Reserve Board? And would not a, 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 if one turns around the, the sageness of stability arguments and says, and would, and would suggest a, a rate of growth of the economy of, let's say, three quarters of a percent greater than that, would be the starting point, uh, would you have a little different policy? Or do you think uh, this is a policy that is most likely to achieve that objective as well? Well, Congressman, let me just say that our goal is not one and three quarter to two percent. That is the forecast of the members of the FOMC and the uh, non-member presidents as to what they perceive our policies and overall policies are likely to achieve with respect to the economy as a whole. Our basic policy, if you want to put it in those terms, is essentially the ranges on money supply. And it is quite conceivable 
that we can have a expansion of money supply and a improved inflation outlook and a significantly higher real rate of growth than one and three quarter to two percent. In other words, we are not seeking to make the growth rate one and three quarter to two. What we are seeking is to try to maintain a stable monetary environment. And it may well be that in that environment, the uh, forecast that the FOMC is making is too pessimistic. Uh, I want to emphasize that it is not an integral part of our policy. That's not what we're endeavoring to seek. We don't vote on that forecast. We basically just report it. Well, I did note in your statement uh, that at several points, and I've never seen this before from you, or, or for frankly in, in reports before, the, the assessment that the majority on, the F on, I think you said, the Open Market Committee uh, believes something. Let me ask you what you believe. What do you think the rate of growth of the economy will be this year? Uh, it's difficult to answer. I, uh, I would say this, that uh, our main crucial goal at this particular point is to uh, put behind us that significant weakening which created a degree of deterioration throughout the latter part of 1989 and to restore some stability. And uh, while I think it is premature to argue that that has been achieved, I think that uh, the evidence of recent weeks is more encouraging than otherwise. Uh, I don't find it very useful uh, to put a specific number down on a forecast, because I'm not terribly certain what it means. I've, uh, I used to be in the forecasting business and I was forced to do that uh, and was always concerned about the degree of refinement that that forecast implied when the truth of the matter is all that economists can do is get a sense of relationships and approximations. And uh, if we can come out even reasonably close in that direction, I think that's as good as we can do. Uh, I have no reason to believe that the number will be uh, different from the average of the FOMC. I hope it will be higher. It may very well be higher. But that is not, as I emphasized before, numbers which we work with. We work with those things on which we take votes. I appreciate that very much, and I, I must say that uh, I appreciate the optimism that, that you're referencing the higher side rather than the lower. Uh, I'm reminded a little bit that Harold Shapiro, who's the president of Princeton, formerly headed an econometric model team at, at Michigan, and he likes to say that they did a study once at Michigan on, on their forecasts, and over about a 30-year period, they had about two or three years in which they predicted a downturn in the economy. And he said they led the nightly news. And every time they predicted an uptick, they got no attention. And so uh, 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 it may be not worse newsworthy that, that you're not predicting a downturn, but I, I appreciate that you're not. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask one modest question on, on a little different subject, uh, uh, and this is more on the, on the micromanagement side of your, of your uh, uh, financial regulation. As you know, the, the uh, Fed has moved in, the, uh, in a somewhat novel direction in, in authorizing several Canadian banks uh, to, to operate uh, in ways in this country uh, that American commercial banks are not authorized to and to allow uh, certain activities that are of a non-traditional nature uh, in a subsidiary of the bank instead of in an affiliate, as an affiliate of the bank. Is that a, a trend that you expect to continue? Uh, is that, uh, does that set a precedent uh, not only for other foreign banks, but vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, potential regulation of the U.S. banking sector uh, with regard to uh, European banks? Uh, 
what it, what is the Fed's view on this particular issue, and, and uh, what was Ms. It? Yeah, Mr. Leach, what we endeavor to do is to follow as closely as we can national treatment. That is that uh, there is a level playing field for all people in the business, whether or not they are domestic or whether or not they are foreign. Uh, on occasion, the structure of foreign banking institutions are different from ours, and it is often not easy to make the principle applicable. And what we try to do in a number of regulations is to find as close an approximation as we can to the spirit of national treatment that we can get. Uh, we have no endeavor to create precedents which uh, create uh, superior positions for foreign institutions relative to domestic. On the contrary, we, we work very hard to make certain, as best we can, that there are no differences of that nature. Well, I appreciate that perspective. I would only stress that, that there are kind of two different ways of looking at national treatment. I mean, the Europeans are saying comparable national treatment is for us to treat their banks the way they treat ours. We're saying national treatment is, is that foreign banks in this country operate the same way as American commercial banks. And the minute we lay down a precedent of giving a, any kind of foreign country a little different treatment uh, than our own national banks, then we lay down a precedent that another foreign country might suggest that they ought to be treated the same way as that one specific country. And my own sense is that it's a, uh, uh, a, a, a minor precedent-setting step that ought to be looked at with a great deal of caution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you, uh, in answering Mr. Leach's first question about the budget deficit, uh, you didn't mean to imply, did you, that if, if we don't balance the budget, we ought somehow ought not to strive to achieve zero inflation? Or price well, he, well, he merely asked me, gave me a choice, one or two. Which legislation would you pass? Right. Yeah, and I'm sure that you would choose one also. I would also. I must say, I certainly would, although I, I don't think we have to make that choice. That's what I'm trying to get at. You're not no. implying that there has no, to be No, in fact, there. I have been supportive of both is one and two exactly. for a long time. Me too. And I, I just don't, uh, I, I, I'd also point out that if we could uh, achieve zero inflation, and in fact if we would just, if we would make it clear we were going to achieve zero inflation, that that could have a very positive impact on, on number two, on balancing the budget. Because we would lower interest rates, lower, now that, uh, that uh, interest on the national debt is the third biggest item in the budget deficit in so much as we can lower the interest rate that government pays on that, we are reducing the budget deficit. So they would work hand in glove. Uh, thanks. Mr. Barnard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Welcome, Mr. Chairman, to the, this very, very fine report of what the Federal Reserve did accomplish in 1989 and certainly your policies and goals for 1990. Uh, on page uh, four of your statement, <clears throat> uh, you, you say that approaching price stability may involve a period of expansion and act. I, you know, I, I need your speech writer for me sometimes. It says here, if you read it, Approaching price stability may involve a period of expansion in activity at a rate below the growth in the economy's potential, thereby re re relieving pressures on resources. Uh, you got me coming, and then you got me going uh, on that particular statement. We have many two-handed economists, even speechwriters. <clears throat> That's good to know, especially in this day and age. Does that mean that the inflation that we're experiencing at the very beginning of this year seems to be in keeping, not with your policies, but in other words, you are sympathetic with that rate of inflation increase that we experience? You mean the, well, the inflation rate so far this year has been horrendous. I mean, I, uh, you mean last year? I'm sorry. Oh, this year. This year. No, this year I would say that uh, uh, as best we can judge, looking at the details of the price structure, the big surge in inflation which has occurred is 
essentially constrained to energy and food and has not spilled over into other segments uh, of the economy. So uh, while we are disturbed by this extraordinary surge, which is largely reversed, uh, it, in our judgment, does, has not seemingly embedded itself uh, either in uh, other costs or in higher wage costs. So therefore, the Fed at this particular point does not see the need to rush to try to remedy uh, monetary policy because of I know of, of no action that we have taken which has responded to those, in, those individual price movements. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, does the Fed agree with the projections of economic growth and inflation that are currently in the uh, administration's budget proposal? Do you think that they are optimistic? Uh, well, I think that you have to look at those forecasts in a different context. Uh, as I've said uh, previously, uh, administration forecasts presuppose the implementation of all of the President's recommendations, including a very significant reduction in the federal budget deficit. And uh, as I've said to uh, other committees of the Congress, uh, this particular set of forecasts, given the presumption that the Congress passes the President's budget in toto is not an unreasonable forecast. Now one can therefore then say, but that is an unrealistic expectation and that may not happen surely in the, the detail will not happen. But that's a different question. Uh, I would, uh, so in the sense of an internally consistent forecast, uh, it is not uh, one which I would have great quarrel with. Obviously, we don't agree with that forecast, but the reason we don't agree with it is that we are not required in our view to assume uh, what the administration does assume. But uh, granted that, uh, I think they have done a job which is uh, a reasonably uh, sensible, balanced approach to the economic outlook. If we, uh, if we rushed, rushed, and I use that word selectively, if we rushed to take Social Security off a of budget, uh, and which would immediately increase the deficits by 67 to 70 billion dollars, uh, how do you see that affecting uh, growth? You mean economic growth? Yeah, economic growth. Uh, I think the action of doing it as such is probably not something which would have any material effect unless and until the markets presumed that action on the actual deficit would occur as a consequence of that. If the markets perceive that uh, a major reduction in long-term budget expenditures is underway by statute, I think we will find uh, a remarkable response. I think long-term interest rates will fall as inflation expectations would fall. And I think we would get uh, very significant benefits from that occurring. But we have to distinguish between shuffling the various techniques we employ to measure the budget process and the real actions with respect to those things which affect savings and investment in the economy and federal borrowing requirements. But you would expect interest rates in the long run to, to, to be reduced, but principally by expectations? No, I, I'd say the mere fact of moving 
the Social Security trust funds off budget and allowing, uh, let's assume, Graham Rudman Hollings to apply to the non-Social Security aspect of the budget would not in itself do anything unless the markets believed that the Congress was serious in meeting those goals. I think that there is a degree of skepticism in the markets uh, which can be addressed in my judgment, only by action. Mr. Chairman, uh, there's a lot of, as a regulator, uh, are you concerned with the uh, depressed condition of real estate, in the and real estate in the Northeast and how it's affecting the banking system in that area? Well, certainly we are. In fact, uh, we monitor very closely and have monitored very closely the old New England real estate uh, uh, environment and have been looking at it in some considerable detail, uh, have uh, been looking at the bank holding companies uh, in New England in some detail and uh, trying to get as much information, judgment and sense of the markets as we conceivably muster. Mr. Chairman, I, my time has expired. I but I would like to ask one other question, which I think is very significant to some of the things you've said. As I understand it, the Fed has out for comment uh, the ability of bank holding companies to underwrite corporate equity. Uh, would you like to address, just indicate your, 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 the, the, how the Fed feels about that? Well, let me just tell you specifically what it is we are doing. A year ago, uh, we indicated when uh, we granted under when we granted so-called uh, section 20 authorizations to issue to underwrite corporate debt we also indicated that uh, we did not think at that time that the underwriting of corporate equity would be appropriate and that we in a year would review that issue uh, with the implication that uh, we thought it was the appropriate thing to do and would go ahead, but only after Federal Reserve examiners reviewed the processes of those involved in corporate debt underwriting to make certain that their particular procedures and organization were adequate to uh, field equity as well. Uh, several days ago, the Federal Reserve Board authorized the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to uh, begin to examine the individual banks who have made application to see whether in fact they have uh, created a structure which in our judgment would be which match our requirements of safety and soundness uh, in such underwriting activities. I presume that activity will, that examination activity will begin within several weeks and when the examinations are complete it will come back to the board and the board will make a judgment at that particular time as to whether or not individual applications should be moved forward or not. That examination is examination of, of underwriting corporate debt. It's to, to see whether, how they have underwritten corporate debt and whether or not they will have the facilities and technical capabilities uh, in the judgment of the board to move forward to expand uh, into equities. This year that has elapsed now, <clears throat> has there been any significant have you noticed anything significant which uh, you feel that the Fed uh, uh, would change its policy on underwriting corporate debt? There is. Uh, I mean, are you happy with the results of, of the uh, permission? Well, that is one of the things that uh, we plan to be looking at. I know of nothing at this stage which suggests anything negative, and uh, I did not uh, uh, sense anything from my 
colleagues on the board to suggest that any of them had uh, altered their basic view that it would be desirable to move forward provided uh, our criteria were met. Well, Mr. Chairman, just to satisfy some of the critics, of which I'm certainly not one, I applaud what the Fed is doing, but during this period of time, you have periodically examined bank holding companies to determine the structure in which they are underwriting this corporate debt, haven't you? Certainly. Not? I mean, they, they have been reviewing. Mean, when a, uh, when reviews have been taking place, uh, they are general reviews. And all of these uh, underwritings is done in separate subsidiaries? That is correct. That is required. Have well, we got time for one more question, Mr. Chairman? Sure. sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm a, uh, I'm a, I was interested in the uh, story which indicated that had Drexel Burnham Lambert not gone into bankruptcy, uh, that there was a possibility that the Fed would come to their assistance. Did I read that wrong? Well, I can't say uh, that you read it wrong. If somebody wrote it, I could merely indicate to you that there is a serious question about the accuracy of such a statement. Well, I was thinking so, too. I, but uh, I noticed it was given wide pub publicity that the Federal Reserve was contemplating coming to the aid of Drexel Burnham Lambert. And I, I said, now, surely when they're not going to underwrite junk bonds now. <laughs> that was my last, my, my last question. Well, let me just say, Mr. Burnham, that uh, the basic uh, concern of the Federal Reserve is not in individual institutions, but in the system. And our concern is always concentrated strictly on making certain that uh, individual firm problems don't spill over into co corrosive effects on the financial system. And, uh, but they would uh, not have had access to the discount window. That is correct. They would not have. Mr. Please. Chairman, I'd like to ask you to comment uh, on uh, just briefly, if you would, on the, the line of questioning that uh, Mr. Leach uh, pursued, because it seems to me that he's touched on, frankly, the most uh, important point concerning the conduct of monetary policy, and that is this question of, of the ideal policy. Now, it, it's my understanding that, 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 that achieving and maintaining zero inflation, price stability, provides the ideal condition for maximum sustainable economic growth. That, that is, that there is no other condition that will better assure that we can sustain economic growth at its maximum level yeah, than me, price stability. And yeah. let me, may I just, pursue, sure. just continue just for a moment? I, and I would say the same thing about employment. Is it not also true that, that, it, 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 what I'm really trying to get at isn't, what, what, isn't it the, the current state of economic knowledge, if you would say? Uh, what I mean to say is, wouldn't you find that the overwhelming majority of economists would agree with these ideas that I'm expressing now, that, that that is the way to achieve maximum sustainable economic growth is to maintain price stability, that to maintain maximum sustainable uh, employment, that the, that the essential condition for that is zero inflation, price stability, and that you could say that about the maximum level of savings and therefore of investment and productivity growth. That, in other words, that there, that isn't it the, the, don't we know enough now about the way our economy works to say with a very high degree of certainty that, that we can maximize sustainable economic growth, employment, savings, investment, and so on, all the things that we've been talking about, uh, including exchange rate stability, by achieving and maintaining zero inflation and price stability. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, let me distinguish between a necessary condition and a sufficient condition. I would say, and I would certainly include myself in this, that a very substantial majority of economic analysts would argue that uh, a non-inflationary environment is a necessary condition for maximum sustainable economic growth and employment and a variety of other things. I would not, and I think they would not, say it is sufficient because it is very easy to envisage an economy with very significant amounts of government controls, various different types of inefficiencies, uh, extremely uh, uh, unstable fiscal policies and budgets in which uh, we would not achieve uh, those goals. So I think... talking about monetary policy. Yes, no, if you're talking about monetary policy, the long-term optimum monetary policy in which one can say how can monetary policy contribute most to these various goals, then the answer is by maintaining a non-inflationary environment. Thank you. Mrs. Saiki. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to add my appreciation for the soft landing, Mr. Chairman. 1989. But looking forward, as decisions have to be made up here on the Hill, in the context of uh, our concern for the rate of growth, I'd like to ask you a question, uh, which may be a little unfair, but I'd like your personal opinion as to whether a change in the treatment of capital gains promotes growth in our economy. Is it, is, is, are we really going to make money, as the Treasury suggests, uh, as, I'm sorry, would we make money for the Treasury, as OMB suggests, or are we going to lose revenues, as CBO suggests? I'd like to have your opinion on this. Well, I have uh, always supported a cut in the capital gains tax rate, because I don't think it is a productive tax uh, for a market system of the type that we have. Uh, I think that uh, lower capital gains tax would basically, over the long run, uh, be productive in that it would add to long-term economic growth. I've also said that uh, I nonetheless supported the 1986 tax reform compromise, which, as you know, eliminated the, the preference for capital gains as part of a package which brought the marginal tax rates down very substantially. And I still support that. In other words, uh, if I'm given the choice of a capital gains tax cut financed by higher marginal tax rates, uh, I wouldn't think that would be a particularly good idea. With respect to the issue of whether or not these are revenue gainers or revenue losers, it is based on a very sensitive set of calculations which refers to the expected so-called unlocking of existing capital gains and the willingness on the part of individuals who have unrealized capital gains to in fact uh, realize them if the tax rate falls and obviously were they to do that they would be paying taxes which they would not otherwise be paying and that in a sense adds to tax revenues rather than losing them. Uh, the sensitivity of those assumptions are very high, meaning very small changes in assumptions can create very significant changes in the revenue picture on that issue. Uh, I have seen estimates on both sides with very small differences in assumptions, and I am personally unable to make a choice as to uh, what is an appropriate rate, because I have not myself looked at and feel, felt comfortable 
with the particular detail uh, that uh, uh, was, was presented. So I would just basically say I am generally supportive of the overall principle, hope we can implement it, but would not like to see it done in the context of uh, unwinding the, uh, what I thought was a very effective Tax Reform Act of 86. Are you saying then, Mr. Chairman, that the gains that we may see with this kind of uh, plan uh, that the administration has proposed will be a short-term gain? Well, not necessarily. I think that uh, clearly they, uh, most everybody uh, has short, upfront, realized capital gains as uh, one would assume that one would get the maximum effect on unlocking uh, at the earliest possible points. But uh, I have not looked at the details of the calculation uh, sufficiently to give you a good judgment as to whether those are statistically uh, as good as they can be. I have no reason to believe that they are otherwise. In other words, they have good people over there making, uh, I think, professional judgments. And uh, uh, I would have every reason to believe that uh, uh, those are as good, of the est as good estimates as you can get. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rocha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Greenspan, I regret that I was unable uh, to be here for the bulk of your testimony, but um, I do note on page uh, 7 that you allude to the um, uh, fact that you anticipate uh, uh, less feverish activity, uh, less feverish pace with respect to um, merger and acquisitions, and I assume here you're speaking, you're alluding also perhaps, I'm not sure, but perhaps to um, um, junk bond, the component of that activity that has been related to junk bonds, uh, and so evidently you've taken into account the most recent um, effects of junk, the junk bond and the Drexel Burnham uh, defaults, et cetera, into your calculations. Would you be willing to go any further in terms of uh, giving a prognosis as to what the future, the effect of this activity, lessened activity, is going to have on the future financial markets? Are we going to see more of a bust in terms of uh, the consequences of uh, the junk bond debacle here? Or don't you like the use of my word, debacle? I won't choose to use it. Uh, I don't actually think there is a debacle here. I think what we are looking at is uh, the uh, satiation of the uh, potential for significant restructuring on a profitable basis. I think uh, a year or two ago before this committee, or the full committee as I recall, I discussed the issue of, uh, well, it may not have been this committee, it may have been one of your associate committees in the House. Uh, I discussed the relationship between the rise in real interest rates that occurred in the early 1980s, the uh, imbalances that that created with respect to the optimization of the various different parts of corporations and uh, argued that, that the process of trying to reestablish balance was the major reason why the very big surge in mergers, acquisitions, and restructurings occurred. I think that what we have seen uh, since uh, is a uh, very substantial degree of activity in trying to reestablish balance in a number of different firms, and that took as part of it a very large amount of conversion of equity to debt. We have had an extraordinarily large amount of liquidation of equity financed by debt in many respects, financed by junk bonds. In fact, one can say, where do junk bonds fit into the balance sheet? 
and to a very substantial extent they have displaced equity and in that sense I think uh, I have argued that uh, uh, that's unfortunate since the uh, capital asset relationships and corporations uh, have undergone a weakening Having said that, there is no question that there are valuable places for less than investment grade corporate bonds. And I think there have been a number of firms which have effectively used them to finance their balance sheet structure and probably have done better than they would have if junk bonds did not exist. My impression basically is that we will work our way through uh, this uh, turmoil that uh, we've seen in these markets and that it will eventually simmer down and that we will find that uh, rather than 200 billion outstanding we'll probably have maybe somewhat less but it will be a viable part of the overall financing structure of American business because I do think that they serve a useful purpose uh, I think they may, their issuances may have gotten somewhat out of hand for a while, but I think over the long run, the, they are a, log a logical niche in the system. I would expect that that's what was going to happen. So your, um, your prognosis is that uh, after some initial turmoil, the, the patient will stabilize. And, yes. and, and not without too much... Um, a problem with respect to either to pensions or other kinds of uh, investment instruments? I don't think so. I think obviously it, uh, there are certain institutions which are going to find that they have gotten, they bit off too much in the way of uh, lower grade securities. But uh, remember that these securities are still a relatively small part of the total investment scheme, scene rather. And as a result of that, uh, while there are a handful of institutions who have a disproportionate large amount of such instruments, uh, that is not generally the case. And I would be uh, most surprised if we had uh, any secondary repercussions uh, uh, which could uh, destabilize the total system. Well, good. I'm, ha I'm happy to hear your assessment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, on that uh, the question of junk bonds, isn't it true that there are only, I don't remember the number, maybe you can refresh my memory, three or four hundred companies in the whole United States that can issue bonds that are considered by the rating agencies to be investment grade bonds, and by definition, everything else is a junk bond. Do you remember that number, isn't it? I don't 300, remember. 300, 400, something like that? No, I, I'm not sure that that actually is a real number in the sense that uh, uh, it perhaps you, it's, it's probably a measure of the number of companies who have uh, investment ratings with either any of the, in, the, the rating agencies and have already issued bonds. But I'm not sure that uh, those who have, who, have, who have not issued bonds are in that number. But that is, a, uh, that is a, I believe, a published number, and I will submit that for the record, okay. Mr. Neal. Anyway, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is it's a relatively small number. It's, it's a few hundred companies. Oh, yes, it's a, it's a relatively small number. Right. And uh, it, just, it, it just seems to me we make a mistake when we refer to... It, it seems to me that those who want to refer to all these other bonds as junk bonds would not, if pressed, want to refer to all those other companies as junk companies. And I, I don't think they're junk companies. They're the, many of them are the, uh, the, uh, the, the growing companies, the, the attracting new investment, producing new products, providing employment, and it's just a shame to uh, uh, attach this pejorative term to their debt issues. They couldn't do it. They couldn't provide those jobs and so on without being able to attract some capital. And so this, it's certainly this, uh, the development of this market in less than investment grade 
uh, debt is a positive one, it seems to me, not a negative one. Some of it's been used in a negative way, but uh, it's certainly not. Well, I think it's safe to say, Mr. Chairman, it's been somewhat overdone, but uh, the mere fact that it's been overdone doesn't undercut the fact that it does serve certain useful purposes. Well, vital purposes, it seems to me. It provides jobs for our people, competitiveness uh, in the world economy. Well, let me, on another subject, um, I don't know, you, don't, you and I have talked about this before. I've been critical, and I believe you have also, of efforts to use uh, uh, a monetary policy to uh, sort of to, to what a lot of people refer to as stabilize the foreign exchange value of the dollar. In other words, to, to have that as a primary objective of monetary policy. And as far as I know, that uh, stabilizing exchange rate has not been a, a uh, uh, played any kind of distorting role in the recent conduct of monetary policy. And I raise this at this time because uh, it does seem to me that soon we may face some real uncertainty and turbulence in exchange rates. Uh, the recent uh, proposal that West Germany and East Germany form a monetary union, uh, it seems to me, will, will certainly introduce considerable uncertainty in the exchange uh, rates of this new German mark vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dollar. Do you agree that we should not use monetary policy to stabilize this rate, uh, but should uh, rather let financial markets determine the value? Mr. Chairman, in our directives, uh, we list the various different factors which we consider in determining policy. And uh, we do look at the exchange rate as an element which will affect the domestic economy and therefore subject to uh, decisions with respect to policy. But uh, the, uh, in, the, in that particular context, how the Federal Open Market Committee will respond to various different things that there are different scenarios that can emerge in the months ahead as a consequence of the growing imminence of the merger of East and West Germany is as yet, I think, uh, it's, it's too soon to make a judgment on. The reason I say that is that it's such a complex set of relationships that uh, uh, I wouldn't want to uh, forecast uh, precisely how uh, policy will move in the event of uh, significant changes abroad. All I can say to you is that the fundamental purpose of policy remains the stabilization of the domestic economy and uh, to create a uh, non-inflationary environment. Uh, how we would specifically react to uh, significant movements of an unstabilizing nature should they occur, and I must tell you I don't believe that they will, but those are the, in that realm of what would you do if, of which there are a long series of contingencies that the Federal Reserve has outlined, and we even have several committees, uh, which look into various what ifs but they are really so complex that unless and until we are actually looking at a specific event, it is really very difficult to know what the optimum policy at that point is, because it's likely to depend very uh, concretely on the particular events of that time. Mr. Chairman, as you know, I, I've been very complimentary of what you and the other board members uh, are trying to do and support your public statements in terms of achieving zero inflation, price stability, and so on. But now I want to ask you, when can we expect a little more progress? If you will look uh, at your own charts, and I don't, your pages aren't numbered in your testimony, but they're the, the uh, they're back in the back of your the testimony this morning, and the, the top chart is the uh, GNP 
price deflator. The bottom one is the consumer price index. And what that shows is that oh, since 1984, uh, except for the year 1986, which was a year in which the bottom really dropped out of oil prices, uh, the average rate of inflation has been about what it is today. That is to say, it's about four and a half, five percent, somewhere in that range, four to five percent. And uh, we've both said many times that that is an intolerably high level of inflation, and that uh, maintaining a level of inflation at that rate uh, does enormous damage to the economy. It keeps interest rates much higher than they should be, than they could be. It it's lowers the, the possible growth rate. It lowers the rate of employment, uh, makes us save less than we otherwise would, and so on. So uh, i just like to know, when can we expect to see some progress in terms of reducing the rate of inflation? Mr. Chairman, I've hesitated to make a specific forecast merely because the particular complexity of the economy at any particular point in time means that it will respond differently to various different types of monetary policies. Uh, what our general thrust is, is to keep pressure on and endeavor to gradually bring the rate down. But uh, I've, I've very purposefully avoided uh, with you in earlier conversations to uh, specify a specific set of price goals independent of everything else. I think we do intend and think it is crucially important to bring the rate of inflation down to a non-inflationary level for all the reasons we've discussed uh, on numerous occasions. And I think that is the fundamental thrust of our long-term policy. Uh, and we are biased in that direction, obviously, over the longer run. But having said that, we want to be certain that we do not, in the process, inadvertently destabilize the economy. And as a consequence, I think that uh, if we were to set specific goals of where we think prices should be at any time, I think we would probably find uh, that we were not optimizing our policy over the longer run. So all I can say, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, uh, our view is that the direction of inflation has got to be down, but I don't think it's productive to set specific goals as to where we would like to see it at each point in time. Well, I know the difficulty with that, but I sure would encourage you to, to to do all you reasonably can, and certainly I don't want to uh, uh, see us uh, in any way destabilize the economy. Uh, certainly I do not want to see a recession and think that there is absolutely no reason. In fact, I think we ought to insist that we achieve this goal of price stability without uh, creating a recession. The re recession would uh, create unnecessary uh, pain and uh, would sap our will to achieve, I think. But it, it seems to me that we can achieve more progress uh, than we have and that it, would, uh, uh, that it would benefit all of our people. And I just, I hope that we can move in that direction uh, more forcefully than, uh, than we have. Mr. Leach. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to take a little different perspective, and, and let me just suggest, and I, I'm hesitant as a representative of the minority to, to be uh, partisan, but Mr. Chairman, the last Democratic president served from 1977 to 1981, and uh, inflation rates were in the double digits. Here they're at 4%. Uh, during a time period in which Congress, which is the primary body in American society responsible for deficits 
ran extraordinary deficits. And one can grade the Federal Reserve Board in all sorts of ways at various points in time. But in terms of maintaining 4 percent inflation, given the level of deficits from the fiscal side, uh, is a mighty impressive performance. And uh, I don't think anyone uh, uh, on this panel ought to be uh, uh, misled into thinking uh, that a lot better job could have been done. And I think it's very impressive what the Fed has done. I'd like to, to turn, though, to, to uh, the subject which I didn't know was going to be raised today and, and related back to uh, uh, the, the Drexel Burnham issue, the junk bond issue. Uh, uh, frankly, Mr. Chairman, I think the term junk is uh, too cheerful a term to apply to these bonds. Uh, junk bond in, uh, implies something that maybe the buyer may not get a full rate of return. Well, these are dung heap bonds. And the reason I say that is that this Congress knows better than any other institution that it isn't the saver that's losing money, uh, although the savers are losing some. Uh, it's Congress and the taxpayer that's bailing out these bonds. And that means they're not just junk, they're dung heaps. Now, beyond that, Mr. Chairman, you've noted that junk bonds from time to time provide smaller businesses uh, equity at a little lower rates than they would otherwise receive. And there are some cases that that's good for the economy and good for the smaller businesses. On the other hand, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board has pointed out that uh, disproportionately uh, these bonds have been used to replace uh, uh, equity with debt. And to the degree they've been used to replace equity with debt, they're dung heaps for the economy as a whole. Now, coming back to the Drexel issue, which was raised, and I was a little surprised, Mr. Chairman, that you didn't come down a little more firmly. Uh, I mean, the fact is the Federal Reserve Board does have extraordinary power and can, in one way or another, intervene and has a, a legal mandate to intervene uh, to assist far more than the banking sector if it's in uh, the interest of the economy. Uh, well, my view is the social case for saving rogue elephants is non-existence, and the economic case uh, is also, uh, uh, in this particular circumstance, perhaps uh, very weak as well. Uh, the failure of large institutions of any variety can be destabilizing, uh, but it strikes me the failure of bad actors, especially ones which feast off over-leveraging of the economy, uh, can be stabilizing rather than destabilizing. And I would certainly hope that there's no hint uh, that the government is prepared to come in uh, in an extraordinary way and prop up a, a, a particular financial institution uh, whose social purpose, I think, has ill-served the economy in the last uh, decade, and the replication of which uh, I think will ill-serve it in the next. And uh, I just want to uh, raise the flag of uh, uh, concern against dung heap bonds and against the institutions that have propagated them uh, on the American economy. Well, Mr. Leach, let me just say that first, I think it's important to distinguish between the uses to which a significant number of the junk bonds, or whatever you want to call them, uh, have been uh, applied. Clearly, they have been, to a very substantial extent, uh, displacing equity. And uh, for reasons which I discussed in my prepared remarks, I think the leveraging of uh, corporate America is creating financial strains, which is something which uh, I personally feel uncomfortable with and I felt uncomfortable with for quite a long period of time. And one can say that uh, an evaluation of the junk bonds issued to date are, uh, would come out decidedly mixed at best. But I think you have to distinguish between what they have been used for and what they can be used for. And uh, my remarks with respect to where they should be uh, refers essentially to the latter because uh, uh, those types of instruments uh, 
may be the best means by which certain small and medium-sized businesses can finance themselves. Uh, and consequently, I think it's important not to throw all of that process uh, under one uh, classification. Uh, there are uh, actually a, a large variety of differences amongst various different types of junk bonds. There are high, it seems like silliness, but there's high grade junk bonds and low grade junk bonds. And I think that the markets will eventually uh, make those uh, particular distinctions. Uh, with respect to Drexel, uh, there was no, there was not at any time uh, any uh, desire on the part of uh, those involved in the United States government uh, relevant to this issue, which considered bailing out uh, Drexel. I think that uh, the issue of bailing out any institution is a very serious issue. Uh, my judgment is we probably do it far more often than we should. I'm, sh I'm certain that is the case. And I, and, uh, I don't think that uh, 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 there was any inclination at all uh, in, in this regard. Well, I appreciate that very much. And I would only make one very minor distinction. I think there's a difference between high grade and low grade, but there's also a distinction between high purpose and low purpose. You can have a higher grade junk bond, which is used to displace uh, uh, equity with, uh, or capital with uh, uh, debt, and you can have a lower grade junk bond, which uh, is not as designed in that fashion. And, no, I would uh, agree with that. And uh, it happens, again, coming back to the responsibility of Congress. Uh, you know, one of the great questions given the, the last decade is whether we want to change the mix of our tax policy. And I don't know if you're prepared to comment on this, but uh, uh, one of the issues that uh, uh, many of us are very concerned with is whether we ought to be perhaps lowering the corporate rate in exchange for uh, uh, eliminating some aspects of tax deductibility of interest. And uh, does that strike you as a uh, reasonable kind of trade-off? Well, I uh, have always argued, Mr. Mr. Leach, that uh, uh, one of the problems that we have in our system uh, that inhibits savings, which I consider the most crucial sh shortfall that our system now has, a shortage of savings, uh, is the double taxation of dividends and, in fact, the whole structure of corporate taxation. And I think that uh, any means that we can find to uh, bring down the level of uh, double taxation of dividends, and I won't, don't want to comment specifically on uh, the mechanism how, because they're all very complex and uh, require a good deal of thought. But I think that process, uh, uh, which uh, is unfortunately expensive with respect to revenues, is something we should nonetheless be carefully looking at because if you're looking at a means of improving the structure of taxation in this country in the broadest sense focused on improving uh, national savings, looking at that process and hopefully uh, revamping it uh, could uh, be a very productive endeavor in my judgment. Thank you very much. Mr. Barnard. Mr. Chairman, on page 12 of your testimony, you uh, and I, uh, you, you enumerated to some degree the international financial markets and its effect on monetary policy. And then on page 12, you said that cross-border financial flows have accordingly accelerated at a pace in excess of global trade gains. This globalization of financial markets has meant that events in one market or in one country can affect within minutes developments in markets throughout the world. Um, I would, uh, I, I'm, I would uh, direct a question having to do with the recent uh, announcements that, for example, with the German currency union of East Germany and West Germany. Now, we are seeing various reports to the uh, to the uh, to the on the West German market 
that it's getting exchanged in narrow ranges from the East German mark. Uh, I'm not asking for your predictions, but what do you do you do you feel that it will be somewhere between four to eight uh, East marks for every one German mark? Uh, East marks for every one German mark. Talking about the exchange rate between the Ost mark and the B mark. Uh, I can't answer that question because uh, the choice that uh, is involved is a very difficult one because uh, the problem w which they have is the uh, extraordinary uh, movement of people from East to West Germany. That's largely caused by the perceived differential in the standards of living between the two. And uh, the choice of where you set that exchange rate creates a major problem because clearly from the West Germans' point of view, uh, if the exchange rate uh, is set uh, in favor of the East German mark, uh, that means that the addition to the West German money supply then becomes larger. But if uh, the uh, rate is set too low, meaning for the East German mark, it means that the real wage in West German marks is still very low and as a consequence, we're very likely to get a continuation of the immigration uh, flow. And uh, I think uh, both parties are most anxious to stabilize that. And I think what uh, uh, one realizes is that uh, there's more to monetary policy uh, than uh, making those judgments. But in spite of that effort, isn't it, isn't it somewhat inescapable that we're going to see higher interest rates in Germany, either from borrowing or otherwise? It's not clear, Mr. Barnard, the extent to which the current run-up in rates has discounted prospective events or not. Uh, there's always an inclination to uh, look at an economic development and then project interest rates as though there are not other participants in the market who have not already made that judgment and taken actions in the markets. It's only when you can perceive an event which the rest of the market has not perceived that you're likely to be able to forecast where rates will or will not go and it is just as conceivable at this stage that rates could go in the other direction because they may have been over discounting what in fact the real ultimate flows may be. So I don't think one can make that statement necessarily. There are tremendous degrees of uncertainty with respect to the process going on in Central Europe at this stage. And I think that uh, we forecasters require a large element of humility when observing that phenomenon. Uh, in your, in your, in, 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 in discussing the aspects that are going on in Eastern Europe, you, you indicated in your remarks that in, even in the past, we've, we have seen tremendous, uh, uh, reactions in other other countries, and still we were, we have been able to manage uh, monetary policy without any problem taking into effect those responsible. That was on page 11. Uh, a former OMB director, however, has said that he's concerned that the interest rates in Germany are going to be such that uh, we could quote lose the control of our monetary policy unquote. You, you don't have that fear? No, I do not, Mr. Berman. My last question, Mr. Chairman, would be that in, in, uh, in response to this fast changes in, in uh, 
in the, in the globalization situation. Are we moving fast enough in this country to, to address the banking laws that stand in between our institutions becoming, uh, uh, being able to, uh, to, to serve the, uh, fin uh, the international financial marketplace? I think not. I think that uh, we are somewhat lagging, and I think that uh, if we could accelerate a uh, move towards uh, repeal of Glass-Steagall, for example, uh, I think that uh, we would find uh, much improved uh, financial structure which would enable us to compete increasingly effectively in the international arena. And we probably wouldn't be as, sus as, 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 as we wouldn't be as, as uh, subsequent to uh, subject, we wouldn't be as subject to national treatment limitations as might develop in the future if we don't do that. I can't answer that, but I would say that uh, we should basically, uh, I think, put this, the issue of uh, Glass-Steagall, I should think, should be fairly high up on the agenda for our considerations. Thank you, sir. I want to, I want to try to uh, address a point uh, Mr. Leach made without uh, engaging in, in in partisan wrangling. I, if, if I, if I. I hope I'll be successful at that. I, I, I mean it in this way, and I mean it. The only reason I take it up, frankly, is because it, it, it seems to me that uh, it's important that, especially in this on this subject of monetary policy, that we not uh, that we have a clear historical understanding of how these things work. And uh, Mr. Leach is absolutely correct that under a uh, Democratic administration during the late 70s, we. The Federal Reserve uh, 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 ran a very high rate of inflation, and uh, it was a mistake. And uh, it, but that was not the, the 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 role of the president in that was in appointing the chairman of the Federal Reserve System. He appointed the uh, chairman who uh, guided that policy and. When it was recognized that that policy was incorrect, uh, President Carter appointed uh, Paul Volcker and, uh, as chairman of the Federal Reserve and gave him the specific mandate of lowering the rate of inflation, which he did. Uh, inflation is a monetary phenomenon, and it was, it was caused by the Fed, and it was, it was then ground out of the system to its at least from double digits to its, rel its current levels by the Fed. And both of those Fed uh, chairmen uh, were named by President Carter, the one that uh, created much of it and the one who, uh, who solved much of the problem. Now, on the question of the role of the, uh, the Congress in setting, establishing budget deficits, I. I think this is, it, again, it's important to set the historical record straight. The, the president under our system has enormous power in this regard. Uh, president Reagan was the most uh, uh, persuasive president, I guess, and uh, maybe in him, clearly since Franklin Roosevelt, certainly one of the most persuasive in history. And he got much of what he wanted from the Congress. and. Uh, I think the Congress did grant him uh, pretty much what he wanted, but to s and and what he wanted, uh, the policies he wanted and got uh, had a lot to do. In fact, created uh, uh, much the, the deficit that we have today, triple the national debt in eight years. Now it's true that uh, that couldn't have happened unless Congress went along with it. Uh, but to try to say that, uh, again, just not to try to be overly partisan, but to try to say that that was something that the Congress did and that the President uh, had no uh, impact on, it just it seems to me misses the point entirely. I'd like to yield to my friend if he disagrees with anything that I've said. Well, I, I, I think that, that, that uh, several of your comments are, 
uh, thoroughly valid. I, I would only suggest, though, that uh, uh, despite the exhortations of anyone from the outside, whether it be President of the United States or her wife, uh, the United States Congress has its own responsibilities to administer. A president cannot spend a dime that uh, we do not appropriate and cannot uh, raise revenue that we do not authorize. And it is the Congress, the United States, that has the primary responsibility for defining whether or not there is a fiscal deficit. Now, the gentleman in the chair is entirely correct that we had a very persuasive president. He's entirely correct that under that presidency, uh, uh, the deficit rose dramatically. Uh, but I'll be darned if I do not uh, uh, think that all of us should understand it's our job uh, to run the fiscal policy of the United States of America. And if we fail, uh, we cannot simply blame a popular president. We must blame ourselves. Well, I have to agree with part of that, too. But look, let, me, let me pursue it one more minute, and I'll get off of this. You know, I voted against the, uh, the well, whatever you want, Reaganomics and so on at the time, and I said that I thought it would create a huge deficit. I underestimated by far uh, the amount of the deficit, but um, what, I'm a member of this body. What, what role do I play in that? What, what's my responsibility there? You know, that was passed uh, overwhelmingly. I think all Republicans voted for that, that, the core policy questions, and they, there were enough Democrats uh, to put the policy over the top. A majority of Democrats voted against it. Uh, well, what, where does the responsibility lie? Well, if the gentleman, you know, let, me, let me just stress that uh, I consider the gentleman from North Carolina to be one of the most distinguished members of this body, and uh, one for whom I hold an, an extremely high regard. And I, I do not want to uh, place any level of personal criticism, but I, I think collectively all of us have a responsibility to uh, recognize that uh, even though we're one 435th of a, of a particular body, we're accountable for the body itself. And uh, the Congress of the United States uh, uh, committed some egregious errors in the 80s, and uh, uh, they can't be denied. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Hoagland. Well, thank you, Chairman uh, Neal, for recognizing me. And uh, welcome, Chairman Greenspan, to the committee. It's a pleasure to see you this morning. Um, you might recall, uh, Chairman Greenspan, it was about a year ago when you gave some testimony before this committee that caused the stock market to go up 25 to 30 points. And, uh, and I told you the subsequent story about how pleased my mother was. Um, well, I just flew in from Omaha this morning just got here about a half an hour ago, and my mother reminded me last night that you'd be testifying this morning. <laughs> and wanted me to uh, give you an opportunity to, I, I know she'll be pleased with the optimistic forecast that you've made here, but if you would like to elaborate on that in any respect, why, I know she would be pleased, and I'd be pleased to, to hear well, that. Well, all I can say to you, Mr. Hoagland, is I would like to convey to your mother my best wishes and <laughs> felicitations, and uh, I'm uh, I hope that when she comes to visit you, uh, I will get to meet her. <laughs> well, she, she does follow you quite closely, Mr. Chairman, and, and she will appreciate that, and, and I appreciate it as well. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, on, a, on a different note, I think a number of us were uh, somewhat alarmed at the testimony that we heard from the General Accounting Office and the Congressional Budget Office about two and a half weeks ago on the progress of the RTC. Um, we were told then that as of, I think it was, I believe the date was January 15th, that only about 46 institutions have been closed, that those were by and large small institutions uh, with assets in the 200 to 250 million dollar range, totaling only about 10 billion, uh, 10 billion dollars. Um, that there were hundreds of sick institutions still out there, many of which uh, had billions of dollars of assets. I, I wonder um, uh, what, what, what you think needs to be done in order to speed up the process. If there's anything that we here in Congress should be doing, uh, what recommendations you might have for uh, your I, colleagues in the 
administrative yeah. branch? I would say, Mr. Hoagland, that uh, uh, we at the Oversight Board and the RTC Board are programming at this particular stage a significant acceleration of activity. Uh, if that fails to materialize in the context or to the satisfaction of the Congress, then I think that uh, the uh, Congress would want to take a much closer look and find a way in which that could be accelerated. But at the moment, uh, uh, as I understand it, there is a significant increase in uh, scheduled, act uh, scheduled activity in that respect. Have you had an opportunity to discuss with Mr. Carney his reasons for leaving Mr. Greenspan? And um, d does that increase or decrease your concern about the way things are proceeding now? No, I did uh, speak to Mr. Carney uh, on it, and I think he repeated to me what he has said in public, namely that uh, his judgment as to what the particular role of the uh, chief executive of the oversight board was was different from the rest from the board, the view of the board of the oversight board. And I think that uh, it was regrettable. I think it was an honest uh, misunderstanding. I don't think that uh, uh, communication was obviously as adequate as one could have made it. Uh, I was sorry uh, to see him uh, resign. Uh, I don't consider it a major setback uh, in forward thrust of the organization. Uh, the, the work of the oversight board continues apace and uh, hopefully uh, uh, the transition will appear to be uh, nothing more than a blip. One criticism we're hearing here in Congress is that um, that there are so many different agencies involved in approving any given transaction, so many uh, um, overlapping lines of authority, and, and a general paralysis that is resulting from a fear of excessive criticism from the banking committee and other institutions. Uh, should a large thrift be taken on uh, and um, the, the resolution of that be imperfect in some respect or another? I frankly don't know how valid uh, the criticism is. I mean, there is a problem that uh, we have got that uh, we knew we had right at the beginning, which is that uh, the structure of the RTC and the Oversight Board is not the type of structure that one would set up for a private corporation. I mean, you would not have two boards in effect. But I think it was the Congress's judgment that even though uh, there is a clear increase in complexity and I think a decline in managerial efficiency to put uh, this type of complex structure in place, uh, I think it was the judgment of the administration and the Congress that when you're dealing with huge amounts of taxpayer money that there has got to be uh, some political oversight to the system. And that political oversight does create uh, a slowdown. It creates a more complex decision-making process than would exist in the private sector. And I think it's a very uh, it's a very understandable trade-off. I don't think it would be appropriate to, uh, since, put in the hands of an independent agency a huge amount of taxpayer funds without the appropriate layering of uh, uh, political control on top of it. Uh, we have to recognize that that political control has a, has a cost. And the cost is some inefficiency. So it's a trade-off that was made uh, when Faria was first uh, established. I think if you went back to square one, you probably would come out roughly the same. 
I think it's up to us to make that system work. And I think that uh, we're all aware of it. And I trust that uh, the uh, speculations that a number of people have in the press and elsewhere that uh, uh, everyone is afraid to move turns out to be inaccurate. So you're, you're satisfied that, that no structural changes need to be made, at least at this point? That's correct, Mr. Hoagland. I would say that uh, for the moment, uh, I would say let's watch the way this evolves. If it fails to meet the Congress's expectations, uh, then I think it should be reviewed. But I have no reason to believe at this stage that that will in fact be the case. And, and are you also satisfied, Mr. Chairman, that men and women in, in the highest jobs of the administration are, are giving this problem the attention and the concern that it needs and deserves? I don't know whether uh, I can answer that very specifically. I will say this, that uh, uh, the various people within the government, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, and the Secretary of the Treasury for Domestic Affairs, uh, Federal Reserve Board in various different levels uh, uh, are heavily uh, committed to this process and needless to say the FDIC is uh, uh, taking on a very large uh, operation. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our chairman for spending so much time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any further questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. I want to thank you also for coming this morning. And uh, uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Just more of it. <laughs> the subcommittee stands adjourned subject to the call of the chair.